So if you think of coral reefs kind of like cities in our world, you know, imagine if you lost the housing, you cut off the electricity, you cut off the water. You know, the cities are where the bulk of the people are, the bulk of the production happens. So when we lose the coral, the coral structure is actually what houses all the invertebrates, the, the fish, the, the plants. So when that structure of the reef dies, it impacts everything from the bottom of the trophic level to the top. The reefs are considered the rainforests of the ocean, so they're, they're the primary producers, and when you lose that infrastructure, you lose all those ecosystem services. When a coral bleaches, it is effectively starving. It has lost its zooxanthellae, the algae that it um, has a symbiotic relationship with that provides the majority of its nutrition and energy. If they don't regain their algal symbionts in a uh, relatively short period of time, they will starve and they will lose the competition for space with algae. The algae will overgrow them and smother them. If the environmental conditions return to normal, they can regain their zooxanthellae. Bleaching doesn't mean they're dead, it just means they're seriously stressed. If they do recover, it'll take a lot longer to recover and the stress will take a toll on them. They will have a lot less energy for growth and reproduction and they're much more vulnerable to diseases. The reef starts to erode through the physical processes and you lose the homes for all the other critters there. So coral bleaching itself, keep in mind you have uh, a nigerians and they are related to the jellies, to sea jellies, sea anemones. They're the same type of critter. They're soft bodied, they have tentacles, um, they have a central mouth and often they have stinging cells. But these animals, they're living two ways. They're thriving by capturing plankton from the water, but they're also thriving by being uh, supply uh, sugars or food from the microscopic algae within the tissue. Coral bleaching occurs in the ocean when the temperatures are higher than normal. But it's not only the, the temperature going up, which happens in a regular season, but it's also duration. So if you get this temperature elevation consistently through a period of time like 8 to 12 weeks, that can dramatically affect the coral reefs. A lot of the species on the reef, what they will do is they will eject the microscopic algae within the tissue and they will turn white. Over 90% of the heat that's been trapped in our atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels has been absorbed by our ocean. When you say global warming, you're really talking about ocean warming. And we're actually seeing that on a global scale, we've raised the temperature of our oceans almost one degree Celsius. So the last two years, Hawaii has experienced widespread coral bleaching. In 2014, we had a bleaching event that really hit Oahu the hardest, and to a lesser extent, bleaching on Maui and the Big Island. But it was widespread, and, and it was something that we'd never seen before. In 2015, however, we had a the biggest warm event Hawaii's ever seen. We saw temperatures like never before. The Big Island lost as much as 50% of its coral. Um, Maui, we're still waiting for some of the data, but anecdotally, uh, 20 to 40 to percent, depending on location. We had mass bleaching here in Hawaii, but we also saw that all over the Pacific. We saw it in the Caribbean. It's one of the worst places we saw it was in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And even up in the Coral Sea in the northern part of Australia, in the north of the Great Barrier Reef, was an area they hadn't really seen much bleaching before. And even there, it was really bad. Locally around our waters, what we saw in particular was certain species of coral seemed to have much higher percentages of negative impacts from the coral bleaching itself. A lot of these corals were the ones that not only were they affected, they turned white, but they didn't recover. So the question now is, how is this going to play out over the next, say, 10 years or so? Will there be enough of these uh, corals remaining to reseed the areas that uh, we've, saw, we've seen the high mortality or uh, will that not bounce back in time before the next warming event. Now, once you know the difference between land-based sediment and you can see it in the water, you, the worst parts uh, of the reef that you look at, if you look up on land, you'll probably see urbanization. 
So a lot of it is coming down when we clear vegetation and we expose dirt. And it does a couple things. It blocks the sunlight when it's suspended. The corals can't, can't obtain the, the energy they need from the sun. And the other critical thing is a baby, you know, coral spawn, a baby larvae, needs a solid substrate to land on and to colonize. So if it's all soft bottom, all sedimented over, you may have mature, older reefs that look relatively healthy, but if you look around, you won't see any of the next generation coming along. So one of the solutions to the sediment issue is obviously everything that's coming down, you want to plug those, the, the worst sources of the sediment. And the challenge is we don't have enough manpower or the Department of Health doesn't have the budget to monitor every single site. And a lot of these uh, discharge areas are construction sites that have cleared land and uh, exposing dirt that comes down when it, when it rains heavily. So one of the solutions we're proposing is an automated water quality, the multi-pro that measures turbidity, essentially the amount of sediment that's in the water. You can place these in the stream bed, it'll feed the data 24-7, uh, anyone can access the data, and you know exactly what's happening, where the problematic areas are. You can put it at the end of the discharge pipes, at the construction site, Mauka and Mackay, of the stream. And with this bleaching event, DLNR sent out a worldwide call to scientists and asked uh, what suite of management um, tools uh, they thought would be the most effective. And so the top, the top results from that were managing land-based sources of pollution, nutrient pollution, which is mostly fertilizers, metabolic waste, wastewater, that sort of thing. Um, a network of marine protected areas, better managed areas, and also herbivore management. So protecting those fishes that can uh, eat the algae or limu and, and help the corals in that competition for space and recovery from bleaching because it's the algae that's really going to win in the end. We need to buy them time to be able to adapt. And to do that, we need to do everything in our power to ensure that they are as healthy as possible to deal with these challenges. One of the hope spots that we have is that researchers are studying resilience in coral reefs and they're looking at how some corals can withstand warmer temperatures and the zooxanthellae that they have isn't moving out. And um, there's a lot of research being done right here in Hawaii at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology out on Coconut Island and there's also some being done in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Some of the corals that are dying out in the field, they're taking them into a lab. In case it all dies out there, they have some seed to put back. So it's like a seed bank. And so even if we have this mass event where everything died, hopefully we still have some that's growing inside under controlled conditions that's doing well, and we'll be able to put it back out there in the water. My hope is that we can adopt better land management practices and not have so much runoff going into the ocean, and that we could also adopt alternative energy solutions so that we don't have to keep putting so many emissions into the air and making the environment warmer. Um, we could drive electric cars, things like that. There's a lot of things we can do that we can already do. And if everybody works on it and works together, um, hopefully it can make a big difference in the long run.